Hello, and thanks for stopping by. Running for just over three and a half miles, the London Underground stretch of line between Paddington and Farringdon holds the accolade for being the world's oldest example of a metro system, having first opened as the Metropolitan Railway all the way back in January 1863. In my previous video, which I'll link below in case you missed it, we looked at how this pioneering line was devised and constructed. And now, in this second instalment, I'd like to give you an idea of what it was like to experience a ride on the Metropolitan Railway 160 years ago. What did the early stations look like? What sort of carriages would you have travelled in? And just how smoky were those early underground steam locomotives? Although scheduled to open in the autumn of 1862, the Metropolitan Railway had a few teething problems to contend with, mainly to do with signalling. But once these issues were fixed, the grand opening was on for early January 1863. It's worth taking a moment to put this date into some context, because when we look at where history was at this point, it's quite remarkable to think that this was an era which coincided with the opening of the world's first underground transport system. In Britain, Queen Victoria was on the throne of course, and aged just 43, she still had much of her long reign to go. Whilst in America, Abraham Lincoln was president, and the country was right in the middle of its brutal civil war. In terms of culture, Victor Hugo's epic novel, Les Miserables, had been published just a few months before. Charles Dickens was still active, and the likes of Edvard Grieg, Franz Liszt and Hector Berlioz were providing the music of the day. It was at 1pm on Friday the 9th of January 1863 that the grand inaugural ceremony of the Metropolitan Railway commenced, when between six and seven hundred ladies and gentlemen gathered at Paddington Station. Here they boarded two special trains, the first of which was hauled by a locomotive named the Wasp and embarked upon a journey along the entire length of the line. Normally, such a trip would only take 20 minutes or so, although on this occasion, it took two hours, as the trains paused for a while at each station, allowing the VIPs to get out and have a nose around. The stations were very much admired, a report in the Times noted. Being alike commodious and elegant, the ingenious contrivances for obtaining light and ventilation were deservedly well commended. At 3pm, the trains finally pulled into Farringdon, where they were greeted with cheers and applause, along with a rousing rendition of Handel's See the Conquering Hero Comes, which was played by the Metropolitan Police Force Band. As was befitting for the occasion, Farringdon Station was bedecked in flags and banners, and on the two platforms, a large banqueting area had been set up for a grand luncheon. This feast had been arranged by the former Albion Tavern, which was once located on nearby Aldersgate Street. Their speciality was turtle soup, which the Victorians loved to slurp down whenever they could. At the mill, a number of speeches were given, including a detailed account of the works by the chief engineer, John Fowler, along with a few words from the Metropolitan Railway's chairman, W.A. Wilkinson, who declared that, This railway differs from all others I ever saw adding, with sound prescience, that it will no doubt in the course of years seem a matter of course. A toast was also raised to their late friend Charles Pearson, the solicitor who'd first envisioned an underground railway for London, but who had sadly passed away just a few months before the line's official opening. The following day, Saturday the 10th of January 1863, the Metropolitan Railway finally opened its gates to the public, thus enabling, as the Manchester Guardian put it, thousands to indulge their curiosity in reference to this mode of travelling under the streets of the metropolis. Trains began running from each end at 6am, 
but by 9am the system was full to bursting, with the cry of no room frequently bellowing out as the packed train steamed into each station. So heavy were the crowds in fact, that one report compared the experience to the crush at the doors of a theatre on the first night of a pantomime. In an attempt to cope with the situation, ticket sales were restricted, and, rather foolishly, locomotives and carriages which were not designed for subterranean conditions were quickly pressed into service. This resulted in dense clouds of smoke and steam forming along the route, most notably at Gower Street, now Euston Square, where ventilation appeared to be at its poorest. So much so that at one point, every single member of staff who'd been breathing in the polluted air for many hours was put out of action, having fallen ill with either sickness, giddiness or insensibility, and two of the men on duty had to be carted off to nearby University College Hospital. The Metropolitan Railway is not a pleasant line to travel by, wrote one journalist who'd experienced a dense smoke on opening day. It is headachey and dreamy, the only comfort being that it does not last long. Another correspondent complained that the tunnels were chilly and recommended wrapping up warm if you planned on venturing beneath ground. Overall though, reactions were positive. Around 38,000 people managed to catch a ride on the Metropolitan Railway's turbulent opening day and by the end of the week, this figure had risen to 225,000. It's worth noting that the next occasion on which the Metropolitan Railway had to cope with severe overcrowding occurred the following year, when on the 14th of November 1864, thousands of people flocked to Farringdon, then the nearest station to the former Newgate Jail, in order to witness the execution of Franz Müller, the man who had been found guilty of murdering an elderly gentleman named Thomas Briggs on a train as it sped through Hackney. The crime was infamous at the time, having been dubbed Britain's first railway murder, and as such, an estimated 100,000 onlookers crammed the streets around Newgate to watch Muller meet his death at the gallows. Muller's dance with the noose was one of the last public executions to take place in the city, and personally, I find it rather incredible that the London Underground is old enough to have accommodated spectators attending such a gruesome event. Although the original route of the Metropolitan Railway is still very much in use, it's now operated by the Circle Metropolitan and Hammersmith and City Lines, there are some very notable differences with the initial seven stations as they appear now when compared to 1863. Paddington, for example, was first known as Bishop's Road. This is what the main station building looked like, and it was located here, in the middle of what's now Bishop's Bridge. In the 19th century, the Great Western Railway's large coal depot ran close to Paddington's Metropolitan Station, and had you been waiting on the platform, you may well have heard the clatter of hooves emanating from the many horses owned by the Great Western, as they trotted to and from the company's nearby multi-storey stables, which were known as the Mint. This is how Edgeware Road appeared in 1863, and as you can see in its illustration, it was sometimes referred to in the early days as Chapel Street. Although the station's buildings changed, Edgeware Road still has plenty of period features. This lovely old sign for a set of long vanished telephones could probably now be classed as one of them. This was one of the areas, by the way, where many homes had to be demolished during the line's construction. From Edgeware Road, the line enters the Metropolitan Railway's longest stretch of tunnel, which was forged using the cut and cover method. Wherever possible along this section, various attempts were made to make the tunnel feel less subterranean by incorporating thick glass tiles and skylights, some of which were tucked in gardens above ground. The tunnel walls were also lined with bright white tiles. Nowadays, of course, with the trains having much better lighting, the tunnels are much darker. Today, the next station, Baker Street, is arguably the most famous of the original seven stations, thanks to a renovation carried out in 1983, which did a splendid job of preserving the oldest platforms as they would have appeared in 1863. 
Having said that, Baker Street feels a lot more subterranean nowadays. You see, when the Metropolitan Railway first opened, these alcoves lining the platforms were open to the elements, their purpose being to provide daylight and ventilation. You can even see the openings marked on this late 19th century map. Above ground, Baker Street looks very different as it would have done in the 1860s, having been greatly expanded and topped off by Chilton Court. This is how the station building looked on opening, a much smaller affair. Great Portland Street was initially known as Portland Road, and when first opened, its platform design was very similar to Baker Street, with long tall rows of alcoves, which as you can see, are no longer here. This is the original Portland Road building, which having two impressive domes, looked somewhat church-like, although the present incarnation is equally ornate. Dating from the 1930s, and rightfully considered an Art Deco masterpiece, it's now Grade 2 listed. Euston Square was originally called Gower Street, and as seen earlier, it was the most poorly ventilated station. Above ground, its station buildings were identical in design to those at Baker Street. Today though, Euston Square's two entrances look pretty bland. Although in and around the ticketing hall, there are some interesting displays related to the station's history, including a copy of the station's architectural plans from the early 1860s. When it first opened, King's Cross Metropolitan, as it was then known, was considered to be the most impressive on the line and looking at these illustrations, it's easy to see why. The early Metropolitan King's Cross station was situated east of the main line station, just here on Pentonville Road. Following damage during the Blitz though, the Metropolitan moved closer to King's Cross and Pancras, although over the years, the old station continued to accommodate main line trains, the last being Thameslink services. Sadly, this historic station closed for good in 2007, Although the ticket hall remained open for another 13 years, in order to allow people to access a pedestrian subway linked to King's Cross Station. This connection though was brought to an end during the Covid pandemic, and as you can see here, the building has now become very grubby and dilapidated. Despite it no longer being in use, it's still easy to spot the platforms of the old King's Cross Metropolitan Station when travelling on Thameslink services between St Pancras and Farringdon. If you happen to be in the area by the way, it's worth popping over to the Regent's Quarter, a small courtyard which lies between York Way and Pentonville Road, because here you can peer down into an old abandoned metropolitan tunnel. This was part of the so-called widened lines, which were built shortly after the Metropolitan Railway first opened, initially to provide a link for goods trains to King's Cross Main Line Station. The last of the old seven stations is Farringdon, or Farringdon Street as it was known then, the original eastern terminus of the line. Rather confusingly, many reports in the 1860s referred to Farringdon as Victoria Street Station, as this section of Farringdon Road was indeed for a time called Victoria Street. For a brief period in the 1920s and 30s, the station was also known as Farringdon and High Holborn. While a lot long redundant, you can still see this old name emblazoned on the station's building, as well as a ghost sign for a long lost parcel office. In the 19th century, the area around Farringdon Station would have been bustling with livestock being led to nearby Smithfield Market. Indeed, the station was fitted out with facilities to accommodate such traffic, and in 1866, the Metropolitan Railway built a direct freight link beneath the market itself. As we've already seen, the most significant difference between the present day London Underground and its Victorian counterpart is that, back then, the trains were steam hauled. Although the idea of powering the railway by either atmospheric pressure or cable haulage had been mooted in the earliest planning stages, it was soon decided that the more conventional method of steam was the way to go. Although as the engines would have to spend much of their time below ground, the locomotives were going to have to be somewhat unconventional. 
The first steam engine designed for operating underground was, well, to put it politely, an utter disaster. Designed by the line's chief engineer, John Fowler, in conjunction with Robert Stevenson, the Fardis engine was, arguably, what we today would call a hybrid. This is the only surviving photograph of the engine. It was taken just outside Edgware Road Station in 1862. Fowler's invention was designed to operate like a normal steam locomotive, but once underground, the idea was that the engine would switch to drawing its power from a pile of preheated fire bricks, thus allowing it to run without producing any steam. The locomotive had two trial runs, one near Hanwell in 1861, and the second on the Metropolitan Railway itself in 1862. Unfortunately, both tests were an abject and dangerous failure. The engine lacked power, and there were fears the boiler would explode. So embarrassed was John Fowler by his miscalculations that he shied away from ever speaking of the matter again, an attitude which, in later years, led the locomotive to gain the enigmatic nickname, Fowler's Ghost. Having said that, Fowler did make one brief begrudging reference to it at the Metropolitan Railway's inaugural banquet, simply admitting, it was clear that the peculiar locomotive I had proposed was no longer the machine to employ. In the end, it would be the Great Western Railway, who were connected to the Metropolitan at Paddington, who would provide the line's first working steam locomotives. Known as the Metropolitan class, these custom-built engines were equipped with condensing apparatus, a system which, in theory, enabled them to consume their own steam by redirecting it from the cylinders back into the water tank. In reality though, this process quickly heated the water to boiling point, meaning it had to be vented anyway, else the boiler would explode. And as such, large puffs of steam still ended up being a byproduct. The heat given off by the locomotive's fireboxes and chimneys also presented problems. As one article at the time said, no persons suffer more in the tunnel from the sulphurous fumes and products of the combustion from the furnaces than the drivers and stokers. Many of these men working on the footplates suffered painful stabbing headaches, and in the summer months the heat was so stifling it was often a struggle to breathe. So tough were the conditions that the Metropolitan Railway encouraged their employees to grow large beards, in the hope that such bushy facial hair would act as some kind of filter against the fumes, even though some quacks suggested the steam was beneficial and could help cure asthma. Working on such locomotives as they puffed below the streets of London would have also been noisy, and so to aid communication between the driver and guard, a bell was used, which clanged so loud it could often be heard by passers-by above ground. Looking at this famous image of an early service on the Metropolitan Railway, you may have noticed that the tracks, locomotive and carriages, appear to be unusually wide, and that's because they were due to the fact that the line primarily used the Great Western Railway's broad gauge track, the 7 foot and 1 quarter inch wide rails being the design championed by Isambard Kingdom Brunel, who insisted such a configuration provided a smoother ride, as opposed to the more common standard gauge of 4 foot 8 inches. The early metropolitan tracks were in fact mixed gauge. As you can see in images of the early underground railway, there was a third rail running in the middle, which enabled standard gauge rolling stock to use the tracks too. In hindsight, this was most fortunate, because in August 1863, just eight months after the line had opened, the Great Western and the Metropolitan, as so many railway companies did in those days, had an almighty falling out. The reason for this was that the Great Western were unhappy with the way in which operations and money were being managed. According to them, the arrangements were leaving them £200 per week out of pocket, which is close to £20,000 in today's money. Consequently, placards were placed at each of the stations, announcing the company was ceasing operation with almost immediate effect. The final Great Western broad gauge service ran on the Metropolitan Railway at midnight on the 10th of August 1863. In the wake of this dispute, standard gauge locomotives and rolling stock were brought in from the Great Northern Railway, who operated out of King's Cross, although their hastily improvised engines were nowhere near as effective, and their carriages were poorly lit too. This led the Metropolitan Railway Company to quickly commission their own fleet of 66 specially designed locomotives, the so-called A-Class. Built in Manchester in 1866, and seen here inside the London Transport Museum in Covent Garden, this is now the only surviving example of an A-Class locomotive. 
costing £2,675 at the time to build. It was an expensive piece of kit and was designed for rapid acceleration, an important factor on the line requiring so many quick stops and starts. As you can see, it was also fitted with condenser equipment, although, as with the early Great Western locomotives, the design was far from perfect and plenty of steam still had to be vented. Such engines remained in use on the underground until 1905. Had you found yourself travelling on the Metropolitan Railway back in 1863, you would have ridden in a carriage constructed from wood, teak to be precise. Each carriage was 40 foot long and could accommodate up to 80 people. This carriage on display at the London Transport Museum dates from 1900, but can still give us some idea as to what Victorian underground travel was like. As you can see, the doors were manually operated with handles, which often encouraged passengers to attempt the dangerous practice of boarding a train as it was in motion. There was also at least one instant in which this system led a passenger to exit the train whilst it was still in a tunnel. This occurred in November 1869, when between King's Cross and Farringdon, the train paused for a moment. At the time, a thick pea soup smog was lingering in the tunnel, having seeped in through the ventilation points and the subsequent lack of visibility led one young woman to think the train had arrived at the station, leading her to open a door and climb out. Fortunately, the alarm was raised at Farringdon and she was recovered unharmed, although of course was greatly shaken. As with mainline railways at the time, there were three classes available on the Metropolitan Railway. Seats in first class were upholstered and had sturdy armrests to avoid overcrowding, whilst those in second were padded with leather. Lighting was provided by gas lamps, which were considered modern for the time. When the Metropolitan Railway first began operating, one journalist had this to say about them. The novel introduction of gas into the carriages is calculated to dispel any unpleasant feelings which passengers, especially ladies, his words not mine remember, might entertain against riding for so long a distance through a tunnel. If you travelled in first class, each compartment contained two such lamps, whilst in second and third, there was only one. It was said the lamps were bright enough to read a newspaper by, although when the train was in motion, drafts caused the flames to flicker considerably, and in some cases, grow out altogether. Initially, smoking was banned on the Metropolitan Railway. It would seem that, even then, the authorities realised the idea of mixing tobacco smoke with clouds of subterranean steam probably wasn't for the best, although this was a rule most passengers ignored, and you may well have found yourself sitting next to a haughty gentleman, puffing away on a cigar or pipe as the train chugged through the dark tunnel. So ineffective was the rule in fact, that the company eventually relented and introduced smoking carriages, a feature which would remain on the underground until the 1980s. With so many metro systems now in operation around the world, it's difficult to emphasise just how novel, and to some, scary, the idea of travelling underground was. A good example of such anxiety can be found in a letter written to the Telegraph, which detailed a breakdown that had occurred one evening during the line's opening week. We were brought to a dead stop in a tunnel, to the great alarm of the passengers, this person writes, who of course were ignorant of the cause of the stoppage, and whose apprehensions of danger were increased by the smoke and steam which rapidly filled the tunnel and carriages. Although relatively safe when compared to mainline railways, there were still several incidents during the Metropolitan Railway's earliest days. On the evening of the 27th of February 1863 for example, two trains collided outside Farringdon Station, injuring around 30 passengers, including one poor woman who had her leg broken. A derailment occurred at Farringdon in September of the same year, whilst at Paddington in 1864, a locomotive's border exploded. As the Penny Illustrated News reported, this blast was so powerful that the dome, which weighs upwards of 600 weight, was thrown upward, almost perpendicular to an immense height. It was discovered that a very considerable portion of the roof of the station had been blown away. Plate glass windows on both sides of the station, of nearly half an inch in thickness, as well as those of the carriages, were smashed to atoms. Amazingly, nobody was seriously injured in the blast, although the driver and stoker suffered scalding. 
The most serious accident to occur in the Metropolitan Railway's early history occurred in 1866, when, on the new extension just outside Aldersgate Street, now Barbican Station, a girder plunged from the roof, smashing a carriage to smithereens and killing three people. Board of explosions and falling girders aside, Victorian travellers, just like passengers today, had to contend with antisocial behaviour. Pickpocketing on the early underground was common, and as you passed through one of the ventilation points whilst riding on the train, you may have heard a loud thud on the carriage roof. This would have been caused by one or two mischievous boys, who, as soon as the Metropolitan Railway began running, found that there was great fun to be had by chucking rocks at passing trains. So common was this practice in fact, that the police were told to keep an extra sharp lookout, and in February 1863, this led to the arrest of one such scallywag, 11-year-old Connaught Coffey, who was caught red-handed near King's Cross. Dragged off to Clerkenwell Magistrate, Connaught was given a caution by the judge, who stated, if any other boys were brought before him for this offence, they would be most severely dealt with. This stern warning appears to have gone unheeded though, as such stone throwing continued. In one such case, a pointsman was injured. Then in 1868, another boy, Robert Shelmore, was caught in the act. And despite being aged just nine years old, he was ordered to pay either 10 shillings or face seven days imprisonment. It wasn't only children who were naughty. There are plenty of accounts of drunken assaults, particularly against staff occurring. And most bizarrely of all, this incident, which is reported to the Times in April 1863. Sir, on Saturday night last, being desirous of proceeding from King's Cross to Portland Road, I obtained a ticket and on the arrival of the train, took my seat in a third class carriage next to the door, when a somewhat powerful man entered and after pushing and showing by gestures he wished for my seat, remarked it was no matter to him. If I did not like to move, he should sit on my knee, which he accordingly did. Although there was plenty of room in the compartment, there being only two more occupants. I at once called the attention of the porters, who were standing nearby, but the train, being in motion, nothing was done. I remonstrated, but finding it no use, I determined on nursing my amiable companion until we reached the Gower Street station. In short, once the train arrived at the Gower Street, this correspondent, who labelled themselves an occasional traveller on the Metropolitan Railway, was fobbed off by the staff who claimed there was little they could do to help. Now sir, the writer concludes, if such excuses as these are to be accepted for allowing insulting scoundrels, thieves or persons guilty of any other crime to escape scot-free, the Metropolitan Railway is likely to become, instead of a great public benefit, a disgrace to the metropolis. Well, it has its faults I suppose, but I wouldn't call what's become the London Underground a disgrace to the metropolis. In fact, I think we'd all be lost without it, don't you? Thanks so much for watching. I hope this video gave you some idea as to what it was like to experience the early London Underground. As always, I'd be fascinated to hear your own thoughts. How would you have coped with the steam? What's your favourite of the original seven stations? And what would you have done if some burly ruffian decided to sit on your knee? Please be sure to let me know in the comments. Thank you so much to all of you who support my channel with your kind words, likes and shares. I couldn't do this without you. If you haven't yet subscribed to Rob's London, then I'd appreciate it very much if you could please consider doing so, as this, along with clicking the bell icon to receive notifications, will ensure that you don't miss out whenever I publish a new video. Plus, of course, it'd be wonderful to have you along. If you're feeling extra generous, you can also support my work with a tip via either my Ko-fi account, which I'll link below, or the YouTube thanks button, which appears as a heart icon beneath the video. Any such financial donations are of course greatly appreciated and they really do help go towards creating content. Anyway, on that note, thanks again for watching friends. Stay well and please be sure to stay tuned.